Okay. Hi, Sean. I think we are live. Hello, everyone. If so. you can see us and hear us, please write this to the chat, a Discord main chat or at YouTube uh, to the stream chat. Uh, I see a question. How long is this workshop? It's expected to be one hour, 30 minutes approximately, but that's our first run for this workshop. So I'm sorry, we cannot guarantee it will be exactly 90 minutes. Good. So it looks like we are good. Yes. So everyone, hello. We can start uh, smoothly. So I'm Alex Volishnev, developer advocate at Datastax, developer relations team. And uh, today with me, Sean McCarthy. Uh, hi, Sean. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, Alex. Yeah, I am a software engineer on the Datastax's uh, tools and infrastructure team. Uh, mostly we build out uh, various aspects of our test infrastructure and sort of a developer convenience, DevOps, those sorts of things. Yeah, that's great. So uh, everyone knows Datastax as a company staying behind Datastax Enterprise in Apache Cassandra and, well, a lot of different distributed, very complicated solutions. And uh, hottest topic for us today is how does uh, Datastax tests its all because, well, testing for the distributed environments and distributed systems is not a simple thing. I know it very, very good. So uh, today we speak about, about Fallout. What's the Fallout like? What is it? Yeah. Uh, so Fallout is a web service which allows us to run complicated distributed system tests, uh, tests against real distributed systems at scale and in production environments. Uh, in a sort of automated, property-driven uh, fashion, kind of mm -hmm. making Great. a lot of sort of complex bits uh, a bit easier. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we can say what uh, Fallout relates to, uh, let's say, kind of not even just an integration testing, but moreover, like uh, system-level testing, making it working all together. Am I right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, it's when you have you know hundreds of gigabytes per node, terabytes across your cluster, uh, you're running into uh, different operations, failure scenarios, uh, you know different uh, like network partitions, all this kind of stuff uh, where you want to make sure not just uh, you know the components are working in situations you expect them to work in, but in the situations you don't see coming. Right? Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, everyone who was doing tests at some point find, uh, found out what unit tests or integration tests are simply not enough when you work on the bigger size systems. That's very familiar. OK, exactly. so it goes good. Stream quality is high. We have a lot of people join it. So I believe we can start. Great. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for, for coming. Um... Got to say, I'm pretty excited that people are interested in this topic. Uh, so this is sort of our agenda for the day. Uh, the goal is to sort of understand where Fallout sits and your infrastructure, uh, the purposes uh, you want to achieve using Fallout, uh, and then we'll get our hands dirty to run some different tests. Um, hopefully, you walk away knowing how Fallout is actually useful and how you can bring it back in into your own uh, into your own world, into your own infrastructure. Uh, two and four here, we're going to be running uh, some tests, actually going over, uh, if you if you registered on Eventbrite, you're uh, you know, here with us live. Uh, you'll have an AMI with, uh, with Fallout running. Um, this might not happen in exactly the times I've sort of slotted them in here, uh, but we'll just kind of see how it goes, right? So um, you say something like running distributed system tests, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. A lot of uh, different perceptions people have about you know uh, how to go about doing that. So, a lot of the times uh, we've kind of run into trouble maybe where people have a particular expectation about what Fallout is going to be. So I kind of wanted to address that very upfront. At its most fundamental, Fallout is a service. You tell Fallout, uh, you, you describe to Fallout a test, and then Fallout takes that, and goes off and executes it. And uh, while that's great for efficiency, uh, seeing as it can be well automated. It's not necessarily great uh, for this kind of a workshop uh, where we might want to be getting our hands dirty. Um, so we're going to end up talking a lot about 
the the why and the what, uh, even though the actual exercises themselves are, are fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, right, so like I said, Fallout is a service, um, just a typical web service. It allows you to manage uh, different users and their individual credentials into external systems. If that's a public cloud, your private cloud infrastructure, uh, you know, build systems, artifactories, these sorts of things. It lets you uh, define tests and share tests, uh, as well as go through the results and artifacts produced by those tests. And then it has all the typical web service access patterns you might expect. Um, Fala is built up out of these three sorts of you know, overarching components. It's the web service. Uh, there is a queue runner system, which orchestrates and schedules the execution of these tests, uh, you know, basing this around uh, the resource availability from where you are actually provisioning things. Uh, and lastly, there are a pair of APIs which enable us to uh, sort of wrap around uh, any kind of system, no matter where you're provisioning it, uh, whether it's, it's virtual machines or Kubernetes, uh, any sort of software tool you might want to install across a distributed system, uh, these APIs uh, make it quite possible to uh, latch on and, and really sort of uh, understand, or not, not quite understand, but um, allows Fallout to automate the, the, the execution of all of these things. So then Fallout also has a particular style of testing, right, where you act, then you log, and then you check. And these are a uh, sort of inviolate uh, order of events. Um, it's a, a bit strange for people who might be used to uh, writing uh, assertions or having sort of deep control. Um, and it's it's a bit of a different mentality when you're writing these tests and interacting with these tests. It, I think the best way to think about them uh, is as an experiment. Uh, if you think back to like the, the scientific method almost, right, you have a hypothesis of how the system is going to behave, and then you design your experiment and collect a lot of data and then you go and you review all of that data. So um, you, know, you, you uh, really want to exhibit uh, control and repeatability, uh, being able to properly isolate different, um, different aspects of the system, how things are created, how things are behaving. Uh, but again, on this repeatability idea, uh, well, it's great. You define once how things work, you drive by properties, uh, and you can rely on it executing the same things each and every time. So uh, just a little bit of context about uh, what Fallout is up front. Um, so then let's really dive in uh, to the problem that Fallout's solving, right? Fallout uh, is a tool. Tools serve a purpose, and it's, uh, I think, most important to understand what that purpose is uh, over necessarily how to use a tool. Um, so. This will be a bit of history, a bit of context in talking about the, the, the problem space we work within. Uh, Fallout evolved out of the Cassandra test environment. And I think it, it's probably good to take a, a beat here and point out that while Fallout uh, was built to test Cassandra, it is not limited to Cassandra. And, and uh, while all the sort of concrete examples I have are, are based around Cassandra. I'll do my best to talk about the, uh, the principles as they can apply to distributed systems more generally. Yeah, and uh, later on when we talk about the Lifecycle API, it'll become clear how uh, we make use of different systems uh, and sort of map onto them and, and gain control. Um, but just a little bit of history, right? Uh, a Fallout emerged to solve this sort of last step in Cassandra testing. Um, you know, in, in the Cassandra world, you have this sort of hierarchy uh, of tests as they kind of grow in scope and complexity. Uh, you have the unit tests, which are running in the JVM. These are unit tests, as I'm sure we're all familiar with, uh, testing uh, the input and the expected output of functions, testing uh, the integration of components within a node. Uh, and, and 
important, crucial, great first step, uh, first check. Um, and then as you sort of broaden out, you want to start understanding uh, the integration between nodes. Is uh, the messaging, you know, like gossip, uh, working correctly? Are our nodes replicating data correctly? Um, but then there's sort of the last, as, as we'll come to find, plausibly infinite set of things to test, which is about the real world. Um, there are, are some bugs which you're not going to come across unless you are uh, experiencing real network latencies. Uh, if you ha don't have you know, hundreds of gigabytes uh, flowing through the system, um, if you're not executing uh, the real operations you're going to be you're going to be running, if you're not uh, experiencing real failures, right? It's it's the the real world is a lot different than CI. When you when your application when your system's out out in the wild, it's going to get beat up in ways you don't expect, uh, yes. and and the world is is going to let you down in ways you don't expect, right? Uh, you know. Working in cloud environments, you have to account for failures. So uh, uh, this is the area Fallout is trying uh, to help us solve. Right? Is is this real world? You know, these real world scenarios. Um, so then, what what do we want to get out of testing like this? Uh, you know, I, I have it laid out here on on the slide. You know, sort of two ideas: stability and predictability. But but. Properly, they are just two sides of the same coin. And this coin is confidence. You know, confidence in the system you've designed, the system you're running, uh, that it's, it's going to behave the way you need, and it's not going to let you down. So when we, when we talk about uh, con being, being confident in your system, you want it to be stable. You want it to be predictable. When we're talking about stability, this is you know, performance and correctness. Uh, Hopefully everyone here is somewhat familiar with both of those concepts. Um, certainly within, uh, you know, at Datastax, talking about Cassandra and databases generally, correctness has a, a fairly rigorous and specific definition, right? We're talking about data, uh, data correctness, linearizability, consistency, these sorts of things. But uh, in, in a broad sort of distributed, general distributed systems, uh, a sense correctness is just whether or not your end user is getting the right result. If that is the correct data on a web page, um, the right price for an item, right? Uh, no shortage of uh, different applications that run in distributed environments. Uh, you want to understand, you want to make sure that uh, performance is, is stable and sufficient, um, that the throughput you're achieving uh, enables all of your users to have access. The latencies uh, you see are low enough that all of your users have a good uh, and consistent experience. So then the, the other side of this coin in, in building out confidence is uh, being able to predict how your system is going to react in different situations. Um, so there's, there are operations and failures. Uh, you should expect both of them to happen. Um, operations you can plan for, failures you, you can not quite plan for. Um, so by running these follow tests, you uh, really want to build out uh, an understanding of how your system is going to react uh, and see that same result, right? That same behavior again and again and again. This goes back to the sort of experimental uh, uh, nature of Fallout is uh, you run the experiment, um, you want to be able to reproduce those results. Uh, there might be a reproducibility crisis in academia at the moment, uh, but there's not in Fallout. Uh, so this is what we're trying to get out of testing like this, but but where what is the problem space that we work within? Um, and this is just the real world complexity of distributed systems. Uh, genuinely, there are there is an intractable uh, number of situations uh, a distributed system will experience. Uh, early on, when I, I started working at Datastax, we uh, we had an idea for a project where we uh, sort of defined all of the different uh, Cassandra clusters uh, you know, we thought were, were uh, reasonable for people to create. And so this, this created a matrix uh, 
broadly uh, across you know, the dimensions of configuration, uh, the different data models, and the different operations and failures and the intersection of all of these things. Uh, and you know, a new engineer getting really gung ho about writing code. I just I just sort of launched myself into, you know, building a, a script and some processes which could uh, take the the definition right this matrix of you know of of unique Cassandra clusters and translate them into fallout tests that we we could start executing. Uh, and, and after a few days or, or a week, my boss asked me. I said, like, Hey, um, how many tests are we actually going to have? How long are they going to take to run? How much are they going to cost? You know, normal questions a manager might ask you about your work. Uh, and I was like, well, I actually, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> quickly did some math. And, and once I, I reached the trillions of tests and millions of years and billions of dollars, I kind of stopped doing the math. Uh, and... and this is sort of a unique problem for data stacks and software vendors like data stacks, where we have software that uh, our users and our customers are running. Uh, but this is true of all distributed systems, right? Uh, data stacks has the unique problem in that we have so many different Cassandra clusters and configurations and data models uh, for all of our different you know, customers and users. Uh, for, for most other people, the, the, the real uh, combinations of scenarios comes out of the operations and failures, right? You have your distributed system with your configuration and your data model, uh, your application, uh, and you're kind of putting that fairly static thing uh, through, through, the, through the works. Uh, yeah, it is a intractably immense uh, problem space. And uh, I, sorry, I want to make a point about this. Um, the kind of guarantees you can make in this space uh, range from abject lies, where you haven't really tested anything, uh, to getting into more formal methods, where you create a model uh, of how the entire system works and how it's going to react and, and uh, sort of push it through all these different scenarios. But, but formal methods are, are 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 really just not able to keep pace with uh, with development, right? Every change to the software potentially changes the model uh, and requires you to run all these things again. Um, so while you can get a lot of certainty out of a formal uh, formal methods, uh, it it really isn't a feasible thing for you to bring into your uh, your you know development process. Uh, so somewhere in between those two poles, we have you know exploring and, and testing out specific scenarios. And uh, what you can really walk away uh, from saying there is that we haven't uh, we haven't seen an error yet, uh, which is good. Um, it's better when you say we've seen these errors and we've fixed them. Uh, uh, but you can't be certain that. Um, your distributed system will never experience uh, a failure, you know, or uh, like a. Um, sorry, I'm trying to differentiate between like failures, network uh, failure situations, like a network partition, and like a, an application failure uh, where your end user is getting the wrong result. Um, yeah, uh, it may look same for the end end users, but. It has a different nature. For me, it always was not only to to fight for the uh, application stability. Like, okay, you can do a lot of things to make application stable, but you cannot make your network perfect, and you cannot make make your uh, infrastructure perfect. It's just uh, impossible. So when that's about not to make it ideal, never failing, because it's unreachable. Although we still have to work for it, but it's about to make uh, mean time to recovery equal zero. And as long as you have uh, low mean time to recover, then no one will notice your failure. If you no <laughs> one notices your failure, it means you didn't fail. <laughs> Perfect. Right. Exactly. Yep. Um... I'm right, sorry. So these, uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, we have a question uh, at YouTube. I would like to uh, also answer uh, live. The uh, question was uh, How do we compare Fallout with Netflix uh, Chaos Monkey? Sure. Um, that's a great question. Uh, so, so, Chaos Monkey um, 
uh, is is running a a uh, sort of random failures across uh, your system, um, and and Netflix famously uh, does this live, you know, in, in their production environment. Uh, but Fallout is more targeted, right? Uh, Fallout itself will go and create the system uh, that you've you've declared and put it through a specific sequence of actions and events, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll dive into that in in a little. Uh, Fallout is is primarily about orchestrating um, and automating testing of this nature. So Fallout would make use of Chaos Monkey, uh, for example, to cause chaos randomly throughout uh, a distributed system. Um, but uh, more often in Fallout tests, we find we we're not looking we're, we're not a uh, looking for random failures. We're actually trying to understand very specific situations. Um, if uh, a network partition happens at a particular time if uh, a node dies uh, at a particular time. Um, it's it's a bit more targeted and focused than Chaos Monkey. Yep. I would also one more one more thing. Uh, as Chaos Monkey mostly running at the production or well staging, I guess as well. Uh, that's about to put the system under some pressure, but usually you don't use Chaos Monkey to put the system. And uh, the, as much uh, pressure, so it will be certainly break. With uh, the fallout, you can put, uh, you can experiment more with staging to understand the limits of your system with a given infrastructure, and maybe then redesign architecture, add some more components, nodes, and so on. So uh, running fallout uh, with on the test environment, you aren't afraid to break everything. Exactly. Exactly. You can really push your system to the limits um, with no repercussions. <laughs> uh, so, you know, distributed systems are complex, and I'm, I'm going to refer back to this complexity just as the general problem space Fallout operates within. Uh, right. So then there's the question, how does Fallout tackle this complexity? And um, tackling the complexity kind of happens in, in two ways. There's, there's a question about how you actually search through, the space, uh, search through this space, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a little while. Uh, but broadly speaking, uh, Fallout takes two approaches to uh, making the complexity of testing distributed systems uh, more tractable, more natural, uh, easier to understand and to deal with. Um, by uh, describing distributed systems in a declarative uh, manner, you really never have to worry about uh, uh, the mechanics of how to create the distributed system, how to operate the distributed system. Uh, there's no worrying about uh, uh, fat fingering in the middle of, of, a, of a process. Uh, it's very amenable to uh, being automated um, and, and finding its way into CI pipelines. Uh, if, you know, Fallout uh, has, uh, uh, Fallout tests are defined, you know, in a YAML format. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you'll probably feel right at home. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, um, wait till you see what those look like. Um, so, but the the main avenue through which Fallout uh, re, you know makes the complexity uh, simpler is by describing things in properties. It's it's much easier to reason about the properties of a distributed system than all of the the operations and the sequencing uh, of how to create it and, and, and deal with it. Um, and, and the little anecdote from, from before when I was writing these matrix tests, doing the math to determine how many fallout tests uh, we were going to have was very easy. I could just think about you know the unique systems, the unique uh, sequence of events we wanted to test against, and the properties, and just sort of you know basic combinatorics, flesh those out. Um, and so we'll, when we go and talk about how you explore the search space, it will become uh, much more tractable. Uh, and, and, and I suppose one last point about properties, um, they, they make isolating the, uh, uh, the differences between systems and the causes of uh, sort of the, the root of why one system is behaving differently than the other. Um, much easier to pull out, right? You're looking at two systems, they have differing properties and you can have two fallout tests which change just one property, right? Um, could be a version, which can actually be quite a broad change. Could be a configuration setting, um, 
a, a different data model. Uh, but you can see how changing just that one thing uh, uh, affects the behavior of this system as a whole, uh, you know, in terms of stability and predictability. Yep. A declarative approach may be a bit unusual in the beginning when you just start to use it because, well, uh, most of the developers use it to write in the imperative uh, style. But when you get used to it, it really gets very, very smooth and convenient to use. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people are used to, you know, control flow. They're used to writing assertions. Um, and that's really uh, not the the sort of testing that Fallout offers. Um, you know, so Fallout, actually, it's probably worth uh, taking a bit of a digression here. Uh, you know, Fallout as the service offers uh, testing in, in a purely declarative format. You just tell it, you know, you just describe the test, send it out to Fallout and, and get your results back. Uh, but the APIs that I was talking about earlier can actually be used to uh, script complicated scenarios with uh, distributed systems. Now, no one at Datastax has ever actually done that uh, because the declarative format has always uh, suited our needs. Um, but there is that escape hatch if you uh, really want to get down uh, and, and have very tight control of how the system is uh, working and being operated against. So uh, that was the last bit of context I, I had for everybody. Um, Let's actually go run a test. So the first test we're going to run is just a very simple performance test. We will create uh, a Cassandra cluster uh, using the Datastax uh, uh, Kubernetes Cassandra operator. Uh, we will run a workload against that using NoSQL Bench, which is a benchmarking tool Datastax open sourced uh, a few months ago. Uh, by the uh, way, we have a NoSQL Bench workshop coming soon. So stay tuned, subscribe to us at YouTube and Eventbrite. Uh, one more thing regarding the tests. Everyone who was registered for this workshop should have got an email uh, with the links, uh, one link for this YouTube stream, one link to our uh, stream at Twitch, like plan B or backup stream, if anything happens with YouTube, below of replication factor. And third one was the link to your personal individual uh, Fallout enabled machine. So every one of the attendees have a machine in the cloud, it's AWS with a Fallout installed, and you can run tests directly there. So what I suggest to you is first watch what Sean will do and how we will run uh, tests with Fallout uh, like uh, Sean is doing. And then you should do those exercises and do those test steps and try your own steps at this machine. And you don't have to install anything. So we did everything for you already. We did. I'll also be using uh, the same Fallout image uh, that was sent out. So everything should look quite the same. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. Uh, if you're you're interested in uh, how to how to set Fallout up, the different options of running it, uh, definitely go look at our GitHub repo at DM Datastax Fallout. Uh, these are the sort of steps we took. This is the environment uh, Fallout is running in, uh, and the AMI. Um, yeah, uh, I think the only thing, the the particular thing of note is that we're going to be running Fallout in a single user mode. So uh, there's only a, a single user. Uh, we we have an uh, sort of an affinity for very straightforward names, as you will find out. Um, there's only going to be one user. You don't have to set up the profile. Everything's sort of running. All of the tests we're going to be running are going to be using Kubernetes in Docker. Uh, so they'll be running locally on the same machine, which is uh, running Fallout. Uh, I clicked on the wrong button. Great. So this is Fallout. Hopefully you can all see this page great mm -hmm. uh, could um, you please Alex... make it a little bit bigger like uh, i mean control plus yeah uh, oh maybe too much <laughs> a little bit back yeah looks good i think i will okay. uh, tell you if we have to change it perfect please please do um mm -hmm. right so this is fallout uh as you might be able to tell we are not ui designers uh, most <laughs> of what we're doing is on the back end uh, certainly, if anyone wants to work with us on the open source, uh, uh, you know, as a community uh, on a better UI, we would be delighted. 
Um, yeah, so as data stacks fallout is an open, completely open source tool now, we are uh, very welcome any kind of pull requests. And yeah, it's if you want to earn some achievements at the open source world, uh, that's definitely a good place to start, or at least maybe not to start, but to continue. Yes, because, well, don't get me wrong, Sean and the team, but the web UI needs <laughs> some love, I would say. Yeah, I'm not even going to uh, talk about the hamburger in the corner. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I, actually, at the end of the talk, I'll kind of talk uh, about our plans for, for uh, the Fallout project in general uh, and, and maybe where people can come and contribute and work with us. Uh, but for now, let's just uh, sort of take a, a tour around the UI and get used to things. Uh, like I said at the beginning, it's a web service. There is a CLI tool written in Python. There's a Python client. Um, this has all the normal REST routes you might expect for the different resources. Uh, you have a user profile. Uh, this is for the, the, the single user we created. Uh, you can manage your different credentials into different services here. Uh, you can set up you know, notifications. Um, uh, darn, I did have to use the, the hamburger. Uh, there's a user directory where you can find other users, look through their tests, uh, clone those, comb through their results, those sorts of things. Uh, one of the great things about Fallout is it's self-documenting. So all of the components that get extended, all of their properties, the, the key pieces of information you need to understand on how to uh, create a Fallout test and operate a Fallout test are, uh, are always up to date with the latest of uh, what, uh, what properties, what the components offer. Um, lastly, there's a test queue. This is sort of boring because, uh, of course, nothing's running on the instance where I am by myself. Uh, but you can see, uh, you can get a sense of the resource contention, you know, how long it might take uh, for your test to be processed if there are lots of tests running. But of course, the most important page is your test page. Now, uh, if you are using the, the, fallout, the provided fallout image, your page will not look exactly like this. I, I cheated a little bit and I, I ran ahead, ran some of these tests, uh, just a bit of practice. Um, so when you're looking at your page, you should only see this one example run. You should all have that in common. So this example is uh, our simple performance benchmark. And there is a very complicated process we have to uh, go through to start this test. So uh, please play very close attention. Uh, you click the Run Now button, and the test runs. Yes, very, very intense, very engaging uh, workshop. <laughs> no, but, right. So well, of course, uh, well, well, well. For everyone who understands how much action and how much job behind that, you know what? Uh, we've uh, the unit tests uh, for a simple scenario. You can write unit tests within a couple of minutes. I mean, it depends, but still, and you can execute them within a couple of moments. But well, that's not a unit testing. That's like a full stack testing with all the databases, applications, and so on and so forth. So it takes time to deploy, of course. Very true. That's that's a good point, right? Follow tests do tend to take a good bit of time. As we can see, uh, this test is going to take about 15 or 16 minutes. Uh, if we come back, uh, Fallout has some great features. Uh, probably the, the most interesting at the moment is this live log. So we can actually watch, uh, this is the file shared log, so it's capturing uh, logs uh, from across the distributed system of every command. We can actually watch the, the output of our test that's running. We're not going to sit here and uh, watch the, the logs scroll by. Um, so you know, having run this test before, I, I can uh, do a little bit of buffering here and talk about what this test looks like uh, when it's finished, which is definitely the more interesting part of things. So like I said in the beginning, Fallout is uh, Fallout has a very specific style of testing where you, you act, you log, and you check. Right. So that acting part, you're creating the distributed system. You uh, have defined a, a sequence of actions you want to take against that distributed system, and Fallout executes that, records all of the different commands, uh, you know, everything that's gone into setting up the system, everything that's gone into exercising the system, uh, as well as at the end of the test, uh, goes across the system and collects artifacts from all of the different uh, components which, which are running 
Cassandra or NoSQL Bench or Kubernetes, however it is. And then the, the last step is the check where you have this quite extensive, you can see 10 megabytes uh, worth of, of artifacts uh, and you have these checkers which uh, can review them at, at their leisure, at will, uh, you know, pull up crucial information, but importantly, uh, the checkers are what determine the actual result of the, uh, the test. So here, this test passed, um, which would be kind of embarrassing if we had something different. Uh, and the Maybe the great thing about Fallout is all of the data it collects. Right? We have, let me actually just do this collapse. We have artifacts from all across the system. Now for, for this test specifically, and uh, we'll go over what this test is actually doing in, in a moment. This test is uh, primarily focused on a server group, right? We have a Kubernetes and Docker cluster uh, with you know, Cassandra and NoSQL Bench uh, running. Uh, and we can see, Lots of artifacts collected from this, right? So um, a, a moment ago, I showed a live log for the Fallout shared log. Uh, these logs are also broken down into the specific uh, node groups, uh, which we'll cover the definition of uh, later on. So you can see the the output um, from you know sort of narrow uh, areas within the distributed system, whether that's a node group, whether that's a node, whether that's a pod. Um, Fallout also, um, will produce an artifact which allows you to connect to the distributed system uh, either while it's running or if you're making uh, use of the, the cluster reusability feature built into Fallout, um, the distributed system will still exist after the test run. So we can see here this cube config uh, is empty because uh, when you delete a kind cluster, it also destroys the uh, the cube config, but if we mm. come to our running test, uh, we can see there is a populated cube config. So you could actually, uh, you know, pull down this artifact uh, and use it to uh, inspect the, the the system as it's running or after the test if you uh, leave it running. Uh, another part of Fallout, or another uh, principle rather of, of Fallout, is uh, that we want to collect enough information to perfectly describe what distributed system has been created and uh, give you enough to be able to replicate that outside of Fallout. Uh, a crucial part of this uh, would be uh, Kubernetes uh, manifests, right? This is actually the, uh, the uh, Kubernetes you know, spec we use to deploy NoSQL Bench. Um, of course, we're doing this horrendous tail dev null uh, workaround. Uh, we'll kind of talk about why and how we'll get away from that later. Um, uh, you can see it's collected some HDR files, which are uh, files which contain performance metrics, um, which are produced by NoSQL you know, Bench. Um, our test has declared four Kubernetes nodes. Each of these has uh, their own uh, artifacts directory, right? Node zero is the master. It doesn't actually have anything interesting going on on it. Uh, we can see though that we are collecting logs from Cassandra. Um, we have the Cassandra system log, which I'm not going to open because it's just a, a giant system log. Uh, but we also have artifacts from NoSQL Bench, uh, logs from the different uh, uh, you know different things we're executing with NoSQL Bench, as well as more HDR files. Um, they all sort of get combined together so we can have a holistic view on how uh, all of the clients, all, all of the NoSQL Bench replicas have been behaving. So you know, Fala is going out and collecting all kinds of artifacts from around the system. Um, and while it is able to uh, uh, both review these artifacts to produce, produce a, a pass fail sort of result, it's also able to review these artifacts and produce uh, or sort of elevate key information. So one of the things that Fallout has, um, we actually stole from uh, CSTAR which uh, if you have been in the Cassandra test world for a while is the old incarnation of uh, uh, some of the performance testing that was done maybe back to 2015. Uh, but it produced these charts, which sort of give you a quick sense of the performance. It's nothing, uh, nothing deep, nothing very, um, 
intense, uh, but at a glance, you can understand how the performance has run. Uh, you can see NoSQL Bench produces many different metrics. Uh, the one we're really interested in for today is the result success. You're executing queries. Hopefully, they were successful. Spoiler alert, they will be successful. Uh, and you can uh, get some various, uh, get the output of various metrics. There's operations per second. Uh, we also have some latency. Um, this might seem bad. Uh, it's probably worth noting that we invested very little effort into uh, producing a very high quality, robust, uh, meaningful performance test here. Uh, it's more about um, understanding fallout, the test design, these sorts of things. Um, further, we're running everything on a single machine, so it is hard to get uh, good, consistent performance. So these spikes are just sort of resource contention between Fallout, Kubernetes, Cassandra, Docker, NoSQL Bench, you know, the, the sort of stress. So um, let's actually talk about this test. Good, I have about eight minutes left before this uh, the test we kicked off finishes and we can go and review that. So let's talk about a Fallout test itself. Uh, like I said, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, uh, this large um, sort of gross YAML uh, won't be too intimidating. Um, if not, I, I do apologize. It is sort of a lot to take in all at once. Um, so Fallout is comprised of, you know, a Fallout test is comprised of two uh, main components. There is the ensemble, which is the entire distributed system under test, every node group, every software, every, every uh, virtual machine, Kubernetes node. Uh, and then there's the workload, which is a sequence of events, uh, a sequence of actions you want to take against the system. So uh, the ensemble is organized into node groups, which are you know, comprised of nodes. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about sort of that logical grouping. Uh, a little later on, we're talking about how to actually extend uh, extend Fallout, write components of your own. Um, like I mentioned, this test is running everything on a single Kubernetes cluster, right? Kubernetes and Docker uh, running the uh, a Cassandra cluster uh, provided by the DataStax Cassandra operator uh, and being exercised by NoSQL Bench. So we need to describe each of those things. Um, we have here the entire server node group definition. Uh, it is comprised of those sorts of, uh, the, those things I just mentioned, right? There is the Kubernetes and Docker provisioner, which describes the underlying infrastructure we're gonna be uh, using. Uh, and there are the configuration managers we are going to be deploying into the uh, Kubernetes cluster created by uh, the Kubernetes and Docker, by Kubernetes and Docker. Um, so if, if you're familiar with uh, Kubernetes or uh, the data science Cassandra operator in particular, uh, there are sort of three things we need to get a Cassandra cluster up and running. Um, importantly, we need to define some storage. And since we are running everything locally, we are just using um, a, a rancher local storage provisioner, uh, which uh, is part of the uh, Cassandra operator. Uh, which is included in the Cassandra operator uh, repository if you are familiar with that. So we have here a configuration manager uh, which is responsible for deploying uh, that uh, rancher local provisioner into our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the, the next two things we need to get our Cassandra operator to create for us a proper Cassandra cluster uh, are is the, uh, the operator definition itself and a, a data center spec. Um, now, if you're not familiar with the DataStax Cassandra operator, I believe we're doing different Kubernetes workshops about that. So I'd, um, yep. just like uh, with NoSQL Bench, uh, sign up for those. Um, you'll get a lot of information out of it. And, and let me just plug the NoSQL Bench uh, workshop again. NoSQL Bench is a fantastic tool, and uh, you should absolutely take the time to learn about it. Um, but we'll, we'll cover a little bit uh, of it here. So um, back on topic, uh, you need two more things to deploy a Cassandra cluster uh, into Kubernetes with our operator. Um, you have the operator manifest, which is actually a series of manifests uh, uh, explaining the, the role, the role bindings, the service accounts, um, CRDs, all, all sorts of things. All the things you would find uh, you know, in this Cassandra operator manifests, uh, YAML over in the Cassandra operator 
repository. Uh, the second thing uh, we need is an actual data center spec. So this is a spec we came up with, uh, especially for Fallout to exercise a particular functionality. Um, we are deploying this size templated data center. Uh, Fallout has a feature with Kubernetes manifests where you can template them using the uh, mustache templating engine uh, to sort of elevate the key properties uh, from that manifest to the, the Fallout test YAML. So in particular here, we are uh, templating the size of the Cassandra data center, um, which is just the, the number of uh, Cassandra pods which are created. So the, the last thing we are deploying into our Kubernetes cluster is NoSQL Bench. Uh, NoSQL Bench is a NoSQL uh, benchmarking utility tool. Um, that might be understating it a little. Uh, it, it's it's an, an immensely powerful tool for uh, 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 running complex, robust workloads against uh, distributed uh, NoSQL um, databases. So um, it's very common in Fallout to need to include external resources. Uh, we have uh, uh, managers here. You can include. Um, uh, we have file managers. Let me let me be clear. We have file managers uh, which can handle um, you know files from external sources. Uh, so when we're executing uh, Kubernetes tests, we need all of the files local to the Fallout machine where those commands are being executed and where Fallout is is uh, connecting to uh, the Kubernetes server. Uh, so uh, we're using you know the local files manager here. Uh, uh, how we get access into the Datastack's Cassandra operator repo is by cloning it, uh, and then also uh, from our data, you know, uh, Datastack's Fallout repository, we are uh, copying this size templated uh, Cassandra data center spec. Um, and we can actually uh, go back to the Fallout artifacts and see the fully rendered uh, manifest for that spec uh, to really properly understand what we've deployed. So with that, we've described everything uh, going on in our system, uh, what are we doing to the system? Well, primarily we have Cassandra running and we want to run a performance test. So we're gonna take at NoSQL Bench and we are going to uh, run a workload against it. Uh, two steps to running a workload. First, we have to initialize a schema and then we have to actually run the benchmark. So fall, the fallout workload is uh, split up into phases, which describe the sequence of events. Uh, phases contain modules, which are particular actions. We'll, we'll dive deep on those uh, a little later. Here you can see uh, two particular phases, a set schema and a run workload, just like I mentioned. Um, and the properties we are using uh, for each of those module calls. Uh, here we actually run into something I maybe should have mentioned earlier. Uh, we have uh, a, uh, like I said, how a Kubernetes manifest can be templated using the mustache engine. Uh, Fallout tests themselves can also be templated using the mustache engine. So we have here uh, templated which uh, NoSQL bench uh, YAML we are using. And I'll jump over to the NoSQL bench repo. We're using uh, a a, a YAML, the uh, CQL IoT YAML, which comes packaged with NoSQL Bench. And so let me jump over there. We can kind of talk about, uh, you know, we kind of need to bounce back and forth between the follow test definition and the NoSQL Bench uh, uh, definition to really understand what's what's going on here. Um, so first off, one of the great things about, uh, maybe let me zoom this bit out a bit. Uh, one of the great things about uh, using the packaged NoSQL Bench YAMLs is they are well understood, well described. So if you're interested, um, do look into the NoSQL Bench, NoSQL Bench repository. Uh, you, can, you can work your way down and find uh, a description of, uh, a plain English description of what uh, this YAML is doing. But the YAML itself uh, is like this. So. Uh, what NoSQL Bench aims to do, uh, let me try and, and just do this in a very high level way, uh, it aims to separate how you uh, execute a workload from what how that workload is defined. So in the NoSQL Bench YAML, we have queries we're going to execute, which are organized into groups, which are tagged. And we have data bindings, which describe 
uh, how data is generated as you execute that workload. So the data bindings are fairly straightforward. Um, you have these functional definitions uh, where there is a seed value, uh, which is the cycle number. Uh, talk about what the cycle is in a second. Uh, you have a seed value, which is pushed through this function for this, uh, for this machine to produce a value for this machine ID parameter. We would take our seed value, we would modulate it, uh, modulate, modulo, do modulus arithmetic um, against that value, transform that into a UUID, a universally unique identifier, uh, and then lastly, cast that into this specific Java type so it's compatible with uh, the Cassandra data types. Uh, this bracketed piece here uh, is uh, a, um, a, a templating uh, piece of NoSQL Bench. Um, sources would allow us, we could specify on the command line uh, a value for sources, and if it's not specified, we'll just use the value of 10,000 here. So intuitively, you can understand that we have a seed ID, uh, a seed value, which is an integer. And we're going to take that integer, we're going to mod that by 10,000. So the number will always be between 0 and 10,000 exclusively. Uh, and then we're going to hash that to UUID. Uh, the hashing means that we're going to be constraining the produced UUIDs uh, within this range, uh, given that if you, uh, you know, input the same number, you'll get the same UUID and do the casting. So what this is really saying is that we're going to create 10,000 unique uh, UUIDs. Uh, and so that's important because the UUID is a part of our primary key of the partition uh, partitioning key for our Cassandra table. This brings us into the statements uh, for NoSQL Bench. Uh, you can see here we have a statement to create a key space. Uh, and similarly, we have this uh, replication factor, simple strategy, probably should never use this in production, but we have uh, a replication factor uh, parameter here. And let me jump back to the fallout workload. You can see we're actually setting it here. We want, uh, for some of our, our tests later on, we actually want the replication factor to be three. So, uh, you know, when we query at a consistency level of local quorum, we can get the correct results. Um, more factor of running a test on a small cluster. Uh, but you can see we're making use of the templating engine here to when we're creating the key space. We have a, a separate command here to create the table. And then finally, the last command in this group is to truncate the table. So uh, in case uh, you know, you're know you running this a second time or a third time or a 25th time, uh, you'll always start with uh, sort of fresh data. All three of these statements are grouped into the same uh, uh, schema phase, which we identify using the tag command here. So then looking at our next NoSQL bench call, uh, you can see we introduce a parameter uh, called cycles. Uh, cycles, um, um, I'll, I'll leave the, the in-depth uh, explanation of what cycles are. Cycles are used as the seed value for, uh, for those, uh, those uh, data generation functions I was describing a minute ago. Um, and they also roughly map onto how many queries you're going to execute. If you exclude cycles like we did in our set schema, uh, they sort of take the default to the number of statements. So excluding cycles when we execute our schema, it just executes all three of these statements. We don't have to worry. But now we want to execute our main phase. Right? This is the actual uh, workload uh, and is comprised of two queries. Uh, there is main phase type read, which has a ratio of one and is executing a select. Fairly straightforward. Then we have our main phase uh, type write, which has a ratio of nine and is doing an insert into this table. So uh, just to speak to what the ratio is, it, this means we're gonna be executing nine writes for every one read. Uh, so 90% writes, 10% reads. Uh, yes, so that is sort of yeah, that's that's NoSQL Bench. Uh, that is the workload we're running. And, so uh, uh, just uh, yes. just to notice, of course, uh, NoSQL Bench is a standalone tool which is not a part of the DataStax fallout, and uh, we utilize it as well as we can uh, use any another tool we will need as a part of the testing. 
Exactly. Um, and when we, we get into the extension bits, uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit about the philosophy Fallout takes on how to, how you know, Fallout interacts with existing and external tools. Uh, yes. So hopefully by this time, I've said enough words long enough that the test has passed. Look at that. <laughs> it is true. So uh, we already reviewed these artifacts, so I won't spend uh, uh, too much time on this again. We'll just take a quick peek at the performance report for the test we just kicked off, and it looks to more or less the same as yep. what we saw last time. As, right. as long as we don't have progress bars yet, uh, if you need <laughs> a progress bar for your fallout test, then call Sean and he will speaking to you <laughs> during the test run. <laughs> <laughs> Just vamping, vamping. Uh, does anyone have any jokes? No, um, so let's let's jump back over to uh, the, uh, I had to the present button, right. So, uh, sorry, let me bring my speaker's notes back up. Yes, great. Um, so actually, uh, before we, we dive into test design, uh, we're sort of going to juggle which tests we're executing. Um, so I lied, we're actually coming back to, to the fallout test. So I have uh, these tests defined already, uh, but uh, I'm going to go through writing them, um, cloning them, updating them, changing them to work the way we want. Uh, so you can follow along. Um, so we're going to take the test we just ran, the simple performance benchmark, and we're going to clone it uh, at the top of the page underneath uh, the, the, the title, uh, the, the test's name. Uh, we have a clone test button. You can go ahead and click on that. It will bring you to the test editor. And so, uh, you know, like I was saying in the beginning, uh, Fallout is interested in dealing with real world scenarios. Um, it's interested in dealing with operations and failures. So sort of makes sense for us to do a little bit of those two things. So uh, in terms of operations, we're dealing with Cassandra cluster. Uh, one of the simplest things we could do would be to scale up the cluster. So what we're gonna end up doing is uh, creating a two node Cassandra cluster. Uh, in Kubernetes, so there are two Cassandra pods. Got to be careful uh, with how I use the word node. Uh, and then we're going to tell Kubernetes uh, to scale uh, the cluster up to a third node. So the first thing we need to do is come to uh, the, uh, the templated spec we have uh, and change it from three to two. Uh, since our Kubernetes and Docker cluster is only going to have uh, four nodes in total. There will be one master control plane node and three worker nodes. Um, so in order to not have to update the, the kind config we're using, uh, we're going to start at two Cassandra pods and we're going to upgrade, or not upgrade, excuse me, scale up to a third pod. So set the size parameter to uh, two. Then uh, we're going to make use of the concurrency uh, of uh, executing actions within Fallout. Uh, workload, the workload is uh, divvied up into phases, which uh, either execute things sequentially or uh, uh, concurrently. So uh, probably important to note, we did write these tests ahead of time. If you're, uh, if you're interested in uh, seeing each test, they are at the uh, Datastacks Fallout uh, on repository in our examples, Kubernetes, and we're going to be running this kind scale up test. So if we scroll down, we can see we have already set the size to two. The next thing we need to do is tell Kubernetes to scale up our cluster. In order to do that, we're going to execute a cube control patch. Now there are, are different ways we could do this in Fallout. We could actually uh, reuse this templated uh, manifest and just set the size spec to three. Uh, but this uh, lets me talk about some other stuff, uh, which is worth uh, getting into. So I'm going to cheat and just copy all of this. <laughs> it is sort of a lot to, to uh, be good at writing out, which, oh, geez, did I include? I did not, good. Wonderful, that looks correct. And since I already have a scale up test, I'm going to name it scale up cloned. So let's just talk about what we've added here. 
we still only have two phases in our workload. The first phase is setting the schema just like last time. Uh, this third phase is, uh, sorry, excuse me, the second phase uh, has three concurrent module calls in it. Uh, we're going to tell Kubernetes to add a new node. We're going to uh, monitor the output from kube control of which pods. It's just sort of an easy way to see uh, whether or not the, the, uh, the node has successfully scaled up. Like I mentioned, there is a way to uh, to block and assert that the scale-ups happened, but uh, it's it's uh, you know, a little bit better for me to talk about it. Um, to do it this way, I can talk about module lifetimes. And then we're going to run the exact same NoSQL bench workload we were running before. Um, since we cloned our basic performance test, everything else is the same. Uh, so then let's just talk, actually, let me kick this off. And then we can talk about what's going on. So back to our test definition. We've added these two new module calls. They're both executing kube control. Uh, kube control is the, the, the Kubernetes CLI tool. I think it's written in Go. Uh, it makes dealing with Kubernetes very easy. Um, so we utilize it to uh, process uh, YAMLs, uh, be able to deal with things um, naturally in the way we might expect. Um, right, so we're running these three modules concurrently within a phase. There is, uh, uh, so how these modules behave within the phase is important. And the two cube control module calls we've introduced here actually have different behaviors. So if we think about the first module call we're making, we want to add a new node. We're going to tell Kubernetes to update the you know, CastDC DC1 spec uh, to set the size to three, right? This is uh, uh, just updating. Um, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, the idea is that you tell Kubernetes uh, your desired state, and then Kubernetes reconciles uh, your desired state with the actual state. Um, so we're telling Kubernetes we would like, uh, we desire our state to be, uh, we desire the size to be three. Uh, we only want to issue that command once. Uh, so we have here a parameter, iterations uh, equal to one. Now the kube control module uh, is is a, a class of modules which are executing uh, commands, uh, and depending on how we want to execute those commands, uh, we want to be able to well, we want to control how we execute those commands. So iterations one uh, says that we want to execute this command exactly one time, and the, the module will finish and we'll move on. This is different from the show pods module. Uh, a cube control module call uh, in that the default value for iterations is zero. And what this ends up doing is repeatedly executing the same command over and over and over again until the phase is completed. So uh, what is the, the main, um, the NoSQL bench workload is going to be what really determines how long uh, this, this uh, phase is going to be running. We will tell Kubernetes to scale up, that will uh, take only a second and finish and be happy. Uh, and then NoSQL bench will be running. Uh, and all the while, we will be looking at the output. Uh, we will be looking at the output from get pods. So if we come into the shared log, we'll see where we are. And the answer is still deploying into uh, Kubernetes. So uh, we'll let this run in the background for now and come in and talk about test design. So I've covered a lot of these things already, uh, sort of showing you where they sit, where they exist uh, in the fallout test definitions. Um, but so let's, let's go a bit deeper. Uh, so when you're talking about uh, a, a single fallout test, uh, like I said, there are two main components. There's the ensemble and there's the workload. So let's focus in on the ensemble. Now, the ensemble, the ensemble is the entire distributed system, uh, which actually does include fallout. Um, if you're looking at a distributed system, 
everything in that system is part of the distributed system. Um, so the ensemble is ordered into node groups. Uh, these node groups have roles, um, but those are just sort of logical groupings and they don't, they don't really reflect uh, uh, what you're interacting with. So uh, really in order to describe the system, we the, the system that we want to test, we're talking about these three things. There is the provisioner, there is the configuration manager, and behind the scenes, uh, the, the sort of powerhouse of Fallout service, uh, are providers. So provisioners are describing the, the underlying infrastructure, whether you've created virtual machines or a Kubernetes cluster. Um, uh, and this handles uh, everything sort of up to a handoff point where the provisioner is dealing with things, uh, with, is dealing with where uh, where things are running. Uh, when you start to transition into configuration managers, it's more about what is running, right? Which specific softwares are installed across the distributed system. Uh, brings us to configuration managers, which uh, again, very apt naming, configure things. Uh, just whatever sort of tool, uh, tool, software, system you might want to hook into. Um, but they, you know, talking about that handoff point between provisioners and configuration managers, the distinction is really that uh, provisioner is where things are running, uh, configuration manager is what is running. It's really oriented around uh, offering services. Now, the services are accessed through providers. So providers uh, both give us access into the different functionality represented in the, the ensemble, uh, as well as information about the ensemble. If you can say, uh, 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 for example, give me a Cassandra provider, tell me what version, give me a, a Java provider, tell me what version, right? There's um, different information you might want to understand, uh, but importantly, uh, it gives you a, an API uh, that you that the rest of Fallout, the rest of the, the Fallout APIs can make use of. So, uh, Again, when you are thinking about what the system you are testing, right? You have the provisioner, what uh, the provisioner, where things are running, the configuration manager, uh, a set of configuration managers, which is what is running, and then the providers, which is how you can gain access to uh, the functionality offered uh, within a node group. So next, uh, we have the workload. Uh, the workload is uh, a set of phases. Uh, excuse me, a list of phases comprised of modules. Now, modules are uh, the actions you want to take against uh, the system. And we'll talk about uh, the different ways those actions can, can look and sort of how to think about writing them uh, when we talk about how to uh, actually write some of these components. Uh, but these, these actions uh, can be both very broad. Uh, they can execute anything anywhere in the entire ensemble, or they could be very narrow. Right? Um, performing an upgrade is a cluster-wide operation. That would be a, a sort of broad module call. Conversely, you could execute a single CQL query. It's a very narrow uh, operation. Uh, in the beginning, we talked about how Fallout has really no control flow, right? This declarative style, you're just saying what you want uh, to execute. So being able to uh, control how things are executing, in particular, the order, the timing, and, and the, the concurrency of the different actions coming across the system is crucial. Uh, so uh, in, in our scale-up test, we had two, fa uh, two phases a phase where we set a schema, and then a phase where we upgrade, excuse me, scale up the cluster while running a benchmark. So the goal is uh, just to see uh, the performance impact scale up has on, on uh, our cluster. Uh, but you can also do uh, more nested and uh, complicated uh, situations. So uh, we are doing all three, uh, the, the, the one and a half, two and a half sort of steps, the scale up and the benchmark while watching the output. Uh, but we're doing the scale up and the benchmark at the same time, right? Those are two concurrent module calls, but fall, uh, fallout phases can be nested within each other. Um, they can actually be infinitely nested. At, at some point, I, I assume uh, we would run out of space on the stack, but uh, 
pretty much as you know as as nested as you would ever need to be Fallout. Well, I can nest them. Um, so it it's uh, very normal to say I want to have uh, one module call running concurrently with a sequence of module calls. Um, for example, this is a very normal test we run uh, at Datastax when we're interested in the impact that hint replay has on performance, where you are running a benchmark, and at the same time, you kill a node, which is the, the first of the sequential module calls. Then you, you wait for the hints to build up, and then you restart that node, and then hints start replaying. We can measure how long they take to replay, how many ultimately built up. Um, and and see the impact that has on performance. Um, so the the important thing about oh, that looks really 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 great. I mean, I'm watching and listening, and I can tell what the ability to design tests like that. That's really incredible. I uh, in my past as an ops engineer times, well, I did similar things, but that's mostly was about the manual and then you do it manual of course it's never repetitive um, repeatable enough and that's with this thing you really can design uh, any test for any situation rolling update uh, or like whatever node outage that's incredible yeah exactly and um uh the sort of the intersection between fallout tests being property based and temp templatable templatable uh don't exactly template it. Um, they fit well into CI systems. So if you uh, push out a, a new uh, version of your software, it's some you know Git SHA. Uh, you know you can uh, kick off uh, a fallout test uh, passing in that SHA as a template variable, uh, which fallout will take and then go build your system, right? That specific version of your system, and then you can. Uh, do like a Jenkins pipeline kind of thing where you have a, a, a series of uh, a set of different situations where you want to uh, pull out some exact information, right? Um, just like this kind of test, like you were saying, right? You say, okay, well, how does uh, my change to Cassandra affect a, a rolling upgrade? Um, and you can sort of build those checks uh, right in uh, to your CI CD systems. Um, Right, but the, the crux of a well-designed follow test is about the, the order and sequencing of the module calls, uh, whether or not they are concurrent, sequential, uh, you know, when they're happening. Uh, so then the last uh, piece of the workload are the checkers. Um, properly, they, they are all artifact checkers. There is a checker type which uh, looks at a specific artifact um, to, to sort of see the history of the executions of the different you know, uh, commands, whether they were successful or not. Uh, but writ large, uh, they all come down to artifact checkers. Um, Fallout produces an enormous amount of artifacts, records an enormous amount of data, and we can use artifact checkers uh, to search through that data, um, pull out key information. Uh, yeah, pull out key information and uh, uh, give us a, a pass fail value. Uh, and then I guess we'll talk about those a little bit more. Uh, in a little. Uh, so if this slide and the last slide about the ensemble and the workload were about um, uh, the design within a test, uh, we have still that uh, that uh, complexity, right? The problem space that I, I, I was talking about in the beginning uh, of distributed systems. And so really there's the question of how you go about searching through that space, right? How do you cover all of the different situations um, when there is an intractable number of them. Broadly, there are uh, at present two approaches which are taken. Um, and before, well, let me, let me put it this way. There are two approaches worth talking about. There are, of course, formal methods which are slow and, and difficult. There is sort of a random search, uh, which is uh, which won't really provide you good coverage and, and will be uh, bad at uncovering bugs. So really the two, uh, two methodologies to uh, searching this problem space uh, come down to being engineer-driven or something algorithmic. So being engineer-driven is very common. I think there are uh, a whole... Um, Oh, it, this has been phrased in a, in a way that is both good and maybe kind of mean. Um, I forget the name. 
there are, are chaos engineers who uh, really specialize in figuring out how, where in this space, right? Which situations to investigate. They understand the systems, they know how they work, and they can identify uh, the situations where we've seen bugs before in the past, or uh, with the new the development of a new feature, uh, we could expect to see uh, some bugs or want to be very confident around the functionality of. So uh, this is great. Um, without using Fallout, you really have to rely on these engineers uh, to create scripts which automate things and to know how to set everything up really perfectly. Uh, but since Fallout is meant to take away a lot of that work, uh, an expert can come in, uh, write uh, the components required to operate against uh, the software they are an expert in, uh, and then leave the rest of the actual testing to those of us who aren't experts um, to search this space uh, via the properties. So uh, earlier I talked about the uh, matrix test the project I worked on um, uh, with all the attractable definitions. So um, after I sent that email to my boss saying, uh, we're gonna have billions of dollars worth of testing to do, uh, you know, he didn't just say, well, we're not gonna do this. Uh, we still had to come up with a set of tests. So we, we sort of took two approaches on how to on how to go about uh, creating a set of tests which we thought created good coverage uh, while at the same time were reasonable to execute. And so um, there are, are sort of, in the abstract, two things we did. We, were, we eliminated many situations which were just not interesting. Uh, and we did this by creating rules. So in the Cassandra world, uh, certain replication strategies don't make sense for a given topology. Um, in our test where we have a three uh, Cassandra node cluster, a replication factor of one is sometimes, well, actually it's probably pretty pretty normal. Uh, I'm definitely not trying to give uh, good Cassandra advice at the moment, but um. Uh, you know, it, it's sort of a simple test, so maybe a bad example. Um, uh, you know, if you have racks um, or data centers, you know, you're going to want to use uh, specific replication strategies. Uh, you know, uh, topology aware, these kinds of things. It's uh, yeah, topology aware, data center aware. I forget the actual name. Uh, network um, topology strategy. Yes, thank you, thank you. I, I always forget what it's called. Um, similarly, uh, given the topology, some only some values for virtual nodes, for example, make sense. Um, kind of a, a rule of thumb uh, is that either you want to have virtual nodes off, you want to have virtual nodes as some multiple of the number of nodes present, uh, also related to the replica, uh, or you want it uh, sort of at the maximum to, 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 to break things up as much as you can. Um, and the other values, while valid, are not common. And so we sort of looked at those and said, yeah, these aren't really things we find uh, worthwhile enough to, to really in invest time in always looking over them. Now, of course, with Fallout, uh, it's quite possible for us to pretty closely replicate any Cassandra cluster. And so if, if uh, some specific person's like, well, I have this configuration with this topology, we can absolutely go investigate that particular cluster. Uh, but when we're just talking about generally covering this problem space, uh, you know, we wanted to invest our time and our money in, in situations which would uh, be common and we expected uh, uh, to fruitfully produce, uh, fruitfully uh, expose bugs in the system. So by creating these rules along the dimensions, we were able to uh, eliminate uh, swaths of this problem space. Uh, the second thing we did was to uh, cover them more efficiently. All pairs combinations is a, a sort of established uh, practice for uh, uh, exposing bugs which arise out of a the interaction between uh, two configurations, two properties of a system. Uh, there's a, a, a thesis that 80 or 90 percent of all bugs uh, arise out of an interaction of only two uh, uh, you know, properties of a system. And uh, 
five percent of bugs come out of three and two percent of bugs come out of four and, and one and a half percent come out of the combination of the interaction between five um, so by uh, uh, instead of uh, creating a set of tests which represent uh, combinations of all unique sets of properties, uh, we did all pairs combinations, uh, which drastically reduces the, the total size of the matrix while still being confident that we had good code, you know, good coverage of the problem space. So this was sort of how we took uh, an engineer-driven approach. Um, I was working with a Cassandra expert at the time, and uh, that made things a lot easier for me, having just started out and not being a Cassandra expert. Uh, but there is a recognition that this is is still not um, it's still not uh, the most efficient way to search through this space. Uh, back in 2015 or 2016, uh, an algorithm came out. Uh, by uh, Peter Alvaro, who is a professor, I believe, at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, no, uh, I forget where he is professor. Really smart guy, uh, really, really genius uh, algorithm, uh, lineage-driven fault injection. What it does is it looks at a good outcome and works backward. And by working backward uh, to sort of condense a lot of smart, complicated things, uh, produces situations which where uh, produces situations where a failure would have an actual impact. So this is doing the same sort of thing we were trying to do with rules-based dimensions, just much more efficiently. It is eliminating areas of this problem space uh, and telling us we don't actually have to go search here, right? Because uh, by the model LDFI uses, uh, you can, you know, assuming your model is correct, uh, you can be confident uh, that a failure of that particular situation, right? That that scenario your distributed system might find it in uh, is not actually going to lead to uh, an impactful failure. Uh, so LDFI, an LDFI pipeline isn't something we've actually uh, developed at, uh, at DataStacks yet. It is something we sort of have a, a keen interest in doing in the future. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and uh, thinking about how that integrates with Fallout, LDFI outputs a, a situation you need to go investigate, and Fallout accepts situations to go investigate and produces information. So those, those seem to have a very uh, amenable relationship to each other. Uh, so that's a sort of exciting thing I'm hoping uh, we get to build out in the future. So this uh, sort of wraps up our talk on test design. Let's jump back over to our Fallout server and see how our test is going. It did finish as expected. So right off the bat, what we were doing is trying to see the performance impact uh, scaling the cluster up. Uh, the, yeah, the performance impact of scaling the cluster. Uh, so we can come back uh, to just this. Just to remind, uh, sorry, just to remind uh, attendees, uh, we increased uh, the amount of nodes for this test uh, it was replication factor one before. Uh, am I uh, right? Yes, it was a RF one. Three, I believe. Uh, yeah, and, and now we go up to three, correct? Uh, I think the replication factor has always been three. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so might might actually been mad at us about the mm -hmm. key space. Uh, but let's just take a quick look at the uh, summary performance report impact on, uh, so we can try and, and see if we can get a sense of the performance impact. Right, uh, NoSQL Bench produces a lot of metrics. You can see these uh, uh, under the operation drop down here. Uh, what we're interested in is the run workload phase, which is our, our baseline, uh, as opposed to the set schema phase, which is uh, sort of quick and boring. Uh, and then we want to be looking at the result success uh, metric, right? So you are executing queries, Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully they're successful. And uh, this gives us information about that whole uh, service time pattern. So the metric we're looking at right now uh, is the operations per second. And right off the bat, we can see a pretty clear pattern. In the beginning of this test, we're uh, getting about 400 operations per second. Of course, this is a tiny Kubernetes cluster running on a small machine. Uh, we're not going to get <laughs> sort of stellar performance out of this. Uh, but at about 100 seconds, we can see the operations per second jumps up to about 550 or 600. 
that was the effect of scale out, right? The the uh, capacity of the cluster increased, and uh, our our you know total throughput uh, grew with it. So if we come and look at latency, yikes! Like I said, a very un, uh, untuned cluster with a lot of resource contention. Uh, the scale-up process had a big impact on performance or on on the uh, the latencies here. Uh, we can see our tail latency is actually uh, quite high. Um, again, very untuned cluster. So this uh, is is in no way indicative of the performance of Cassandra itself or of our Kubernetes operator. Really, I'm just trying to uh, showcase that we can. Uh, create a test and look at the impact it has. Yes, so uh, just to add, this spike between 50 and 100 of seconds uh, specifies very well the process of a bootstrapping of a new node because it's network uh, intensive operation of the transferring of all the data and so on. So this tiny Cassandra cluster is busy bootstrapping a new node. But as soon as the node is uh, bootstrapped, we immediately see the decrease of latency for 99th, uh, which is very typical, yes, because we have more nodes available and data is reshuffled uh, within the cluster. And also it's very clearly seen in the previous um, uh, picture. Could you please make one step to the uh, slide we had before? Yes. So that's exactly, take a notice. This, um, a spike on the last picture, like with uh, 99th uh, performance, uh, it has uh, with, with between 50 and 100 seconds because the node was bootstrapping. And soon as node was finally bootstrapped by 100 seconds, cluster immediately started to work uh, to be more performant. And we see it in the operations per second growth from more or less 400 to more or less 600. By the way, at our Cassandra workshops, we tell all the time what Cassandra is linearly scalable. That's a perfect example for adding every new node. You have very good linear increment with a very low to zero overhead on the adding new nodes. And that's once again, one more nice, very nice example of that. Interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought that uh, the increase there is almost perfectly linear, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. Um, great. So, uh, I guess one last thing, right? We see the spike in 99th. This was because uh, the phase we wrote uh, was executing the scale up right at the beginning, right? It was executing the scale up call and the benchmark all at the same time. Um, so we can see here, it's just happening in the beginning of uh, the workload, sort of one last point. So then what the last thing we were doing uh, in that phase was watching um, uh, Kubernetes output to see that the uh, gosh, right, to see that the, the, the Cassandra pod we wanted to add uh, was actually created. Uh, like I mentioned a, a few times now, uh, there's a way for us to have fallout block and, and assert that, I know that fallout doesn't really do assertions, behind the scenes it would, it would have uh, ensured that uh, the scale was uh, successful. Uh, sort of trivially, we can see fallout has collected uh, Cassandra logs from all of the different Cassandra pods. So here we have cluster one, DC one, default stateful set zero, cluster one, DC one, default stateful set one. So those were the first two pods uh, created when we initially created, uh, initially uh, deployed our cluster. And then we have cluster one, default stateful set two. So that's, that's a quick sanity check that the, uh, the new pod was created. And if I can correctly uh, intuit, which, uh, yes, we can see now there is a ton of get pods output uh, happening uh, here at the log, right? So one of the things about Fallout, it is recording every command executed. This is sort of a horrifying and a horrendous way to monitor this, but uh, we can see now that we execute our uh, patch command through kube control and start executing these uh, get pods. So by the time uh, our patch let me let me be clear right before our patch command is completed we execute this first get pods call and we can see there are only two cassandra pods uh, including the operator pod itself and uh, the nosql bench uh, pod uh, after the patch command is complete we have our stateful set two pod uh, this is the new cassandra node we've introduced 
and it goes through init. It does initializing. It gets to running, uh, running one out of two, and then uh, at some point it gets to two out of two, uh, and then we just kind of keep outputting the the get pods info blindly until NoSQL bench has finished. Right. So uh, explicitly, we can see uh, the cluster was successfully scaled up. So that is the second of the three tests uh, we are going to run today. The last test, right, if, if fallout is about real-world operations, real-world failures, last test has to be a little bit of chaos. And I'm not just talking about my presenting style. Uh, so let's let's come back to example. And we're going to clone this again. Let me let me do that a bit slower. Uh, let's come back to our the first test we ran, the simple performance benchmark. Um, and let's clone this again. We're going in the same way we introduced a scale up. We're going to introduce a, a failure scenario. So we come hit the clone test button, uh, and we are back at our editor. So what we want to do for this chaos test is cause one of our Cassandra nodes to die. So sad. Um, we're going to use a framework called Chaos Mesh. This is a Kubernetes native chaos uh, uh, platform created by PingCap. Stuff is brilliant, convenient, uh, genuinely really useful. So we need to add uh, three things to our YAML here. First off, we uh, are going to kill one of our Cassandra nodes. Uh, so we want to have enough nodes. Uh, three, uh, an important thing to understand here that is that uh, the NoSQL bench uh, workload we're running is, is going to be executing its select queries uh, at a consistency level of local quorum, which means that uh, of all of the replicas, all of the replicas of the, uh, the data, uh, a quorum of them need to respond uh, to produce a valid result. Um, since we have a replication factor of three, each of our Cassandra nodes will be a replica of all the data. And uh, a quorum would represent two. So uh, to uh, exhibit Cassandra's like always on um, you know, kind of capability, uh, our data model needs to be able to uh, withstand the failure of one Cassandra node. Um, and so we achieve that with a replication factor of three. And we take one down, we still have two, uh, two replicas available for us to query and get a consensus. So a little bit of background. Uh, so introducing chaos mesh is, is fairly straightforward. Uh, we need to add here a configuration manager which will deploy chaos mesh. Chaos mesh. Uh, I forget if it's that. Um, so great point. I've now forgotten whether or not chaos mesh is a, uh, I'm pretty sure it's, what is the name of this character? I don't think it's a dash, but let me just come back to the docs. Check, I can see right here, the name is Chaos Mesh. Uh, we're not actually gonna use any, any properties of Chaos Mesh, we're just going to deploy it uh, with all the sort of default properties. Great, now Chaos Mesh will be deployed into our uh, Kubernetes cluster and we can make use of it. Uh, now, the, the second thing we need is uh, an external resource uh, to define uh, the chaos experiment. Um, chaos Mesh is still a fairly new addition to Fallout. Um, and the way we designed it, we uh, we started very flexible. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, designing configuration managers and, and modules uh, after we kick off this test. Uh, but because we designed it in a way which is so flexible, uh, we need an external file which defines uh, what Chaos Mesh calls an experiment. Yeah, we need to define the complete experiment. Uh, again, I'm just gonna come here and copy and paste something. Uh, in our Datastax Fallout repository, under the Kubernetes examples, we have a kind chaos test. This is the exact test we're about to run. You can see we've added uh, the Chaos Mesh configuration manager here. And what we need is this pod chaos YAML, uh, which is present here in uh, the data stacks repository. So I'm just going to copy and paste this and add it to our local files. So what this is going to do is at the start of the test, Fallout will go out, download this pod chaos YAML and make it available to the Fallout test. So the last thing we need to do then is actually execute, uh, is, is make a chaos mesh uh, module call. 
I'm going to cheat again. I do, I do apologize. Uh, and just copy the entire the entire module thing here, and then we'll we'll talk a bit a bit about how it works and the properties here. So we are uh, similar to how we were calling the scale up module call. Uh, we are doing two concurrent uh, module executions here. We're going to start our um, our NoSQL bench workload, and immediately Chaos Mesh is going to be told to kill a pod. At this point, it is probably worthwhile. Uh, I do actually believe it's up here in Chaos Mesh resources. Yes, it's worthwhile to look at the Chaos Mesh experiment we are using. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into this. Chaos Mesh is, is I, in my opinion, very well documented. Uh, what we're doing is the pod kill action. It is going to kill a pod. It is going to have a duration for 30 seconds. So the pod will be dead for 30 seconds. It's only going to kill one pod. And we are going to determine which pod to kill with this uh, label selector. If you're familiar with mm -hmm. Kubernetes, everything is done with labels. So uh, we have here the managed by Cassandra operator will identify one of our uh, uh, Cassandra nodes you know, yeah the so, pods, uh, like pods. yeah this way we will not kill the cassandra operator by itself or uh, anything else running here but exactly one of the boats managed by the cassandra operator so one of right. our cassandra nodes exactly and then the last bit uh we're going to repeat this every five minutes so we see we'll see uh, when we review this test that our nosql bench workload is going to last longer than five minutes so we'll actually get um uh, uh, two uh, about about two failures uh, in there. That we can kind of go back and look at that performance chart. So um, here we have the uh, chaos mesh module call. Uh, the properties which are important is that the namespace we are uh, executing chaos mesh within uh, should be the same namespace that we've deployed our Cassandra operator to. This is a templated value. If we come all the way up to the top to our test templates, we can see we are deploying uh, the Cassandra operator and the data center and NoSQL bench all into the Cassandra operator namespace. Chaos Mesh itself does not need to, uh, let me rephrase that, Chaos Mesh, the, the controller, does not need to live in the same uh, namespace as we've deployed things, but the experiment we're executing does. Uh, so uh, we specify that here. We can keep everything consistent and neat uh, using this template variable. And what we have uh, here defined as the experiment is uh, a managed file marker. So we have uh, these managed files, uh, which uh, follow, can reference using this special format, uh, the brackets file, and then the name of, uh, of the the file we want to use, uh, of course, the experiment we want is this pod chaos YAML we pull down. So uh, that is everything we need to do to get this test running. Let's give it a name, failure uh, cloned, since I have a pod failure. And then we hit save, takes a second, and we hit run. Very intense process to get these started, yikes. So it is preparing, checking, great, we're off to the races, and we will come back and review that uh, after we talk about the next thing, which is uh, actually extending fallout and operating uh, fallout in, in a, at a production level. So uh, everything I've been talking about so far has been fairly general. Um, principles uh, of fallout testing, uh, ordering phases, a uh, little bit of hands-on stuff, um, but, but now there's the real question of how do you connect Fallout to your systems and your uh, services, right? How do you get Fallout to interact with your distributed system? Uh, Fallout is meant to do this, <laughs> unsurprisingly. So uh, yeah, let's just jump right in. Um, the base of Fallout is properties. So when you start to uh, think about how to uh, connect Fallout to your systems, uh, it, it begins with the properties. Um, I, I, again, Fallout having no rigorous control flow, or not rigorous, but um, you know, not the control flow we're used to, having no assertions, uh, and, and being uh, declarative, 
properties are, are really the crux of everything, right? All the functionality that we want to have access to need to be uh, well mapped to properties. So you want um, your properties to do a good job expressing how they are going to affect the, the system, uh, whether that's in how it's set up or the action you're taking against it. And uh, you want them to be amenable, again, towards uh, exploring the problem space, right? All the different situations are distributed system. Right? Because uh, again, properties are how we drive. They're, they're how we decide what is going to be run, how things are going to be run, uh, and reflect back to how uh, Fallout controls things. So for example, in our tests, uh, we are executing uh, NoSQL bench, and there is a property there called cycles. Now cycles is, is a, a NoSQL bench concept, which really reflects how it's being executed, uh, but it's, the, it's, a, it's a great property to bring into Fallout. It reflects uh, the number of queries we're gonna, going to execute, so there's a sense of the duration of the test, there's a sense of uh, the amount of data that's going to go into the test. Uh, so it's this this knob that you can turn to really tune the workload uh, quite easily, and it makes it very convenient to drive. So uh, within Fallout internals, properties are reflected sort of by two pieces. The properties themselves uh, are contained within a data type. This is uh, the property spec. It's how we get all the self-documentation coming out of it, and it also does some simple validation and transformation uh, uh, you know, from the YAML into Java objects. Uh, and then the the sort of foundational interface uh, of uh, this is this is our uh, what's in our lifecycle API is the property based component. This is uh, uh, how the rest of Fallout uh, uh, understands what properties are available from a component, and uh, which very important. Uh, but more interestingly, maybe we also do um, a, a steps of validation before we execute a test. So um, you may have noticed that when I hit the run button on the, the, Kubernetes and Docker's, the Kubernetes and Docker tests we've been running today, the UI waits for a moment. Uh, it doesn't just immediately come back with a, a running test. It, there's, there's a gap. And what's actually happening in that gap is Fallout uh, is reaching out to Kubernetes and Docker to uh, do some uh, basic checks. Uh, Fallout has pinned the Kubernetes and Docker version we're using uh, to 0.8. I believe we're using 0.8.1 on the AMI. Um, and this is because, you know, depending on what version of Kubernetes and Docker, uh, the the interface changes a little. Uh, uh, how do you get the cube config out? How do you declare names? These sorts of things. So we have that pinned down. What Fallout actually does is goes out and checks that the right version of Kubernetes in Docker is installed on the machine where Fallout is running. Uh, this is a, a fairly simple validation check, but it elucidates what's a really crucial idea here. You want to protect people. Uh, you want to protect the users uh, from doing the wrong thing. And that is a tricky thing to define in Fallout, right? The point is that we can get a distributed system into a dangerous or wrong situation. So uh, you know, how can we prevent people from doing that? Um, this, this is a bit of an art maybe in deciding uh, what people are allowed, are allowed to run and what people are not allowed to run. Uh, and and the, the basic premise for doing this is that follow tests are very expensive. Uh, but, you know, by virtue of running uh, in real infrastructure, uh, real workloads, um, in, in real scenarios, they they cost money and they take time. And so, uh, if someone submits a test to Fallout, and we can notice, um, you know, a, a mistake, uh, a missing property, um, something which doesn't quite make sense, in a way which is uh, going to make their test somewhat meaningless. Uh, we don't want to let them run that because it's going to waste their time. And no one likes having their time wasted. Uh, so a, a really like trivial example I, I think I always kind of come back to is missing Java. You're, you're trying to uh, run Cassandra, but the virtual machine you're running it on doesn't have Java installed. 
that's not an interesting failure scenario. Strictly speaking, that is a failure scenario. You, you try to run Cassandra and the result is a failure, but it's boring. We know what that is going to be. It's just going to tell you that there's no Java present on the machine. So uh, a user submits a test, they're missing Java, we spit out an error uh, that says, you are missing Java. Uh, yeah. yeah, that is uh, what we do with property-based components. Great. So uh, let's let's talk now about uh, the grouping. I, I know I, I've sort of skirted around this up until now. Uh, the lifecycle API is is the API we use to attach onto uh, different systems, right? Whether that's uh, you know the provisioner, the configuration manager, the provider. These are all what describe uh, the actual uh, you know what's actually out there. Uh, but Fallout needs a way to organize them and and interact with them. So I. I I got to be honest, I love this slide. It's got this wonderful um, symmetric asymmetry about it, uh, which uh, genuinely reflects uh, the design of the Lifecycle API right in the middle, right? The crux and the core of the Lifecycle API is the node group. We're good at naming things. A node group is just a group of nodes. Uh, but it's important that they all share a, a common provisioner and they share a common set of configuration managers. This means that for any node within a node group, you should be able to ask for the same providers. The access pattern to providers is saying, uh, give me the provider from this node, or give me a provider from this node group, and then you have access to the functionality there. So uh, organizing them around the node group uh, uh, allows us to, to uh, keep this shared set of uh, service. Uh, between them. Node groups are also reusable. Uh, yeah, there's, it's a, a core feature of Fallout that um, you can uh, leave clusters running at the end of a test. Uh, like I said, they, there are these access artifacts which get produced so you can gain access to the cluster you've created, to the, to the system you've created. Uh, and you can actually reuse it in subsequent Fallout tests. This is useful because it allows you to skips, uh, it allows you to not have to repeat various steps uh, that are taken. So then around the node group are uh, just sort of things to organize uh, fallout. We have the node at, at the lowest level, which is sort of the, the, you know, the atomic unit in fallout. Um, and if you look at the code of node, it's just a bunch of uh, you know, access information methods, right? There's not really a lot of functionality there. Similarly, uh, Ensemble is a, uh, uh, all, it represents all of the different node groups, right? These, uh, every node group is assigned a role. So an Ensemble has a, a, a sort of series of roles. Um, but similar to the node, it's, it's just a bunch of access uh, methods, not a lot of functionality. So this is sort of how uh, Fallout organizes everything, right? And the, and the crux of it is comes down to the node group. So with that said, let's talk about the lifecycle. I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. This is the Fallout lifecycle. Uh, it is modeled after Unix run levels. Uh, we start at the top uh, where the cluster is destroyed or you know non-existent. We work our way down to the bottom. Uh, where uh, everything is installed and running. And then we work our way back up to the top to destroy it again. Uh, provisioner is a property-based component, right? Uh, reflects uh, how to uh, create the actual system. It's responsible for this portion of the life cycle and has uh, specific methods uh, to, to transition us you know, from destroyed to reserved, right? You have a reserve method, which is the reserving state. Um, so the question is, uh, what do you want to design a provisioner for, right? Provisioner is going to give you access to the underlying infrastructure. That's both uh, if it's a virtual machine or a bare metal instance or a Kubernetes cluster, if that's running in your private cloud, if that's running in a, a public cloud provider, uh, and it's it's also related to um, the the system it's 
the system itself, right? The the operating system, the version of Kubernetes, uh, these these sorts of questions. So it, it handles all of the aspects of where things are running. Uh, and so if you're connecting Fallout into your infrastructure, this is where you're going to start. Uh, we'll be a provisioner. Um, the good news is, however, you are provisioning uh, infrastructure now, Fallout is capable of wrapping around. Uh, it's probably a good time to take the digression uh, about how Fallout views uh, you know, its, its relationship with other tools. Uh, we don't ever want to duplicate existing functionality. If there's a tool which exists and does things well, we just want to use it. So uh, we have methods which slot into this lifecycle, uh, which you can choose to implement or you can choose not to implement. Uh, either is actually fine, which allows you to take the methodology, right? The the uh, whether you're using Terraform or or something of that nature, uh, you know how you're provisioning your infrastructure right now. You can fit this in to the Fallout lifecycle, and this is really what we think makes Fallout uh, so generalizable to any sort of distributed system. So, on the right here, we have the the part of the lifecycle which the provisioner is responsible for. Uh, we're going to just talk about the methods uh, which are related to the upwards transitions. Uh, these, these, for the most part, have uh, downwards uh, counterparts. Uh, so you know you can create or you can destroy. There's sort of two sides. Uh, they're sort of the same method, just uh, depending on which direction you're going. So um, at the the first method for uh, provision you're going to implement is the reserve method. Uh, Fallout has a queue runner system. So uh, the queue is going to start processing a test run, looking at uh, whether or not the resources are available. This sort of has a, a uh, this kind of comes out in, in multiple steps uh, beyond just uh, the reserve method. Um, no, it is, it is actually just the reserve method. Uh, you, you check for availability, whether or not these resources are available. You wait, uh, the queue waits until these resources uh, have been reserved, which means that we, Fallout, can be confident that all of the resources necessary to run this test uh, will be available to us, and we're not going to, halfway through, uh, discover that we cannot provision the, the node we need to scale up, for example. This is very similar to how we were looking to validate the properties uh, a principle uh, of Fallout's design is that we have all of these resources up front. Uh, just because, again, we don't want to waste people's time, where they designed a perfectly good test, but halfway through they couldn't you know, get access to that last node they needed. So we only execute a test if we have all the resources available to us. The second method uh, is uh, about actually creating um, uh, creating the the infrastructure. This is usually kind of connected with the reserve process. A lot of uh, cloud providers, uh, you you say, give me some infrastructure, please, and then you have output that you're sort of watching. And a certain point uh, in that output, you can be confident the infrastructure is created and allocated to you, uh, or well, let me like allocated to you. But there are still sort of those last steps, uh, like a, a cloud init scripts that need to finish up. So you can return from reserved and then come back to created and block until everything has finished. And this is important because uh, returning from reserved once you know uh, the resources are allocated uh, allows the queue to continue processing other test runs. Uh, but you want to block the fallout lifecycle from transitioning past created until we are certain the, the infrastructure is uh, ready to go. So then the next method we have is the prepare method. Prepare uh, handles the, uh, you know, when you're setting up like a, a Unix box, uh, user groups, permissions, um, maybe install some system-wide um, uh, software packages, uh, those kinds of things. I'm not sure why that, that sort of slipped past me. Uh, so it's sort of setting up the system in general. And then you have the start method, which is the last bit of the provisioner's responsibility. Uh, this 
this is sort of like the last the last step. Uh, and like the SSH uh, based uh, the, you know, the SSH world, um, you have a, a user which is you know with a full fully fledged profile and environment setup. Uh, and at this point, the provisioner hands off responsibilities to the configuration manager. So configuration managers, again, are responsible for specific software. You can have many configuration managers on a node group. Uh, uh, it, there are sort of some common patterns uh, that we've emerged, um, and this reflects just normally how you build uh, software. Uh, you're you know, cloning something from GitHub and building it with Maven or Gradle, or you're downloading a binary and uh, making it executable. Um, yeah, it's 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 fairly uh, normal. This this stage is uh, when you're talking about thinking about how to uh, integrate Fallout into your own infrastructure. Uh, when you're thinking about configuration managers, it's how do you go about uh, installing your system. Um, for Cassandra, you might be using Ansible or Chef or, or something of this nature. Uh, again, Fallout doesn't want to replace functionality. So if you're using those tools, uh, it's easy to just say, to just uh, go and execute uh, those commands uh, just in the same way you'd be executing them from the command line. Uh, command line. Uh, the, the configuration manager has uh, sort of two methods in the lifecycle, uh, a configure and a start. Configure uh, is sort of intuitively is installing, setting configuration variables, uh, building the project, that kind of stuff. Uh, start is actually turning the software on. You know, For Cassandra, you can have a node on, you can have a node off. Uh, so it would allow you to park it uh, or do an upgrade, that kind of thing. Um, and once uh, the configuration manager uh, gets all the way to started services running, we want to make uh, providers available. Uh, you know, providers means you have access to, to the software. Uh, we have this method called register providers. This associates uh, the providers a configuration manager uh, produces uh, to specific nodes. Uh, and then you, know, you can go and access the providers, uh, get information, get access uh, from them in their normal pattern. Uh, and then the last thing configuration managers are responsible for uh, are the artifacts from that software. Uh, Cassandra world, this is system logs, debug logs, GC logs, that kind of stuff. Uh, at the end of the test, we're going to go around the system and collect them. This happens in a pair of methods, uh, prepare artifacts and collect artifacts. The difference between them that is prepare uh, is executed while the, the uh, system is still running and collect uh, uh, is executed after the system has, uh, you know, the, the software has been stopped. Uh, so if you need to, if you need uh, a system up and running uh, to get information, uh, like hit a, a rest endpoint and, and get a response, uh, you know, there's the appropriate uh, space to do each of those. So uh, in both this slide and the last slide, uh, I had a bullet point here uh, about inspecting state. So this is how Fallout produces uh, its, its or this is how Fallout enables its cluster reuse feature. Uh, at the beginning of every test run, Fallout, the, the first thing Fallout does is it reaches out uh, to the cluster, uh, to, to the this distributed system to inspect what state it's in. A lot of the time, that state immediately comes back as does not exist. We know the cluster uh, is in it's a deleted state, and we can we can uh, begin the transition methods to to create the system. But you can uh, mark clusters for reuse in your testing YAML, which will leave them in the run level your test run ended at, uh, and the next time you execute that test, Fallout will go out, inspect the state, and see the, you know, the provisioner will report uh, the infrastructure exists and is, is uh, sufficiently set up. The configuration managers will each reach out to their pieces of, of um, you know, the, the, the software they've installed uh, and, and check whether they're running, if they've been installed, if they need to be built. Um, and, this really allows us to skip repeating steps that we've done before. Uh, a, a normal use case would be if you want to test 
multiple versions of Cassandra, but they're all running on the same hardware, uh, you can skip provisioning and reprovisioning and reprovisioning uh, that hardware with every test. What you would end up doing is write one test which uh, provisions the software and installs Cassandra, and at the end of that test uh, brings the lifecycle run level down to started services unconfigured, which essentially will uninstall Cassandra. Your next test uh, will kick off trying to install, uh, planning to install a, a different version of Cassandra. The provisioner check state will return that uh, the infrastructure exists, but the configuration manager will return that no software is installed. So the test will find itself at started services unconfigured and know now to go reinstall that new or different version of Cassandra. So uh, a little bit of principle on how uh, you can uh, speed up the efficiency of running your tests. This does bring us now to providers. The providers are uh, the the heart and soul of uh, Fallout's functionality, and and unfortunately in in the past they've been sort of neglected. Uh, but especially as we've begun integrating Kubernetes, uh, they're becoming more and more and more important, uh, uh, and and in helping us to abstract away uh, uh, the underlying infrastructure and let us just focus on what we are trying to accomplish. Uh, like within modules and, and things like that. So again, the, the point of a provider is to give us access to certain functionality uh, as well as information. Um, for Cassandra, this could be executing no tool or SQLSH, uh, uh, getting the version of Cassandra. Uh, NoSQL bench, um, we, are, we are executing uh, the, the NoSQL bench utility. Uh, providers very often rely on each other. For example, in our test, we are running a Cassandra cluster and uh, NoSQL bench. Now, uh, the NoSQL bench module reaches out to the NoSQL bench provider to execute NoSQL bench, uh, naturally. The NoSQL bench provider uh, requires the Cassandra provider to tell it what the contact point is. Where do I actually have to go uh, who do I have to go talk to? Um, in Kubernetes, is, it's a service within the cluster. Uh, what is the name of that service uh, so I can actually connect to the cluster? So NoSQL Bench can connect to the cluster. Um, so this is uh, sort of the intersection between you know, what information is being transmitted as well as having access to uh, functionality. So uh, as we, as we uh, integrate more and more of Kubernetes into Fallout, uh, we need to abstract away more and more about the underlying infrastructure. So providers are taking on a much greater role, uh, abstracting away uh, the, the storage, uh, like fallouts storage um, for artifacts, as well as uh, uh, storage on, um, uh, I, I don't know quite how to explain this, uh, the storage between, uh, you know, difference between having a file system on a virtual machine or a persistent volume uh, attached to a Kubernetes pod. Um, you don't really want to have to write code, which is you know code in a module, which is sort of okay. Well, am I in a VM? Am I in a in a uh, uh, a virtual machine? Uh, you just want to say, give me the storage provider for my node group. Give me uh, the a path I can write stuff to, right? So I can I can go and execute a command. Uh, so abstracting away that kind of stuff is is really where. Uh, providers are heading into the future. Now, uh, let's talk about modules. Uh, if everything we've been talking about up to uh, until now has been about how to uh, create the system to test and how to uh, uh, have access into the system to test, uh, modules are really what we want to be doing to the test. Um, right? So they're, they're translating something which is happening uh, into properties, right? I'm going to execute this command. I'm going to uh, kill a node. I'm going to run this workload, and you want to be able to uh, drive. You want to be able to drive those actions uh, by the properties. And so, while a module has access to the entire distributed system, right? You it can uh, get any provider from any node group in the ensemble. Uh, 
writing modules which are are very large and all encompassing uh, uh, ends up making things difficult to to deal with, right? Because the the properties that are going to need to be present in that module uh, uh, grow, right? The number of properties that need to be present grow, and it becomes less and less clear uh, about what each of these properties are are doing. Um, so really when when I think about writing a module, it's uh, I, I kind of think about uh, you know uh, them doing the same sorts of things. Uh, you know, I think about them in the same sort of way we might talk about uh, events happening in a in a distributed system, right? So if if you think um, you know getting paged at three am on a Saturday because uh, you've you've had some uh, uh, you know, service interruption on your system, you start investigating what's happened. Well, you saw a burst in traffic. I don't know why it happened at 3 a.m. on a Saturday, but it did. And there was a burst of traffic, and that caused uh, your authentication server to uh, to fall over and die altogether. And, and it didn't come back up. Uh, and so your application is trying to hit this server and, you know, running retries, and these are sort of piling up... Uh, uh, and you know, it caused a, a service interruption. Uh, modules are best when they can uh, take the system we have, uh, we can reason about events in the same way and bring us to that situation. Uh, right? We want to have a module which will cause a burst in traffic, a module which will kill the authentication server, uh, and then we can uh, produce a new version of the application, which has a fix for you know handling retries better, uh, and we can measure uh, you know how the system is reacting, uh, you know how your system is is handling you know that situation uh, hopefully in a a better way, um, right? And if you kind of think about how you you map those events to properties, uh, you know for a burst in traffic, you know. How much did it increase? Was it a 10% increase? Was it a 10,000% increase? That would be pretty eventful, <laughs> right? Or, or when the authentication server goes down, how long did it go uh, down for? And it, it's mapping your properties back uh, to these events uh, in ways which really help you uh, search through the problem space, right? So. Modules really end up being the actions you have available to you, right? Again, follow doesn't have, uh, you know, you know the, the follow testing tables don't have this control flow that we might be used to. Uh, so you're really trying to think about actions and events and how they're sort of, uh, you know, hitting the system. Uh, another sort of, of note about designing modules, uh, similarly to how it's it's not great to have modules um, uh, executing like large complicated things uh, sort of all contained within a single module uh, uh, your modules can kind of end up uh, 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 kind of uh, ending uh, executing sort of an arbitrary thing uh, if that's a bash script or uh, I mean, I mean, ultimately, right? It's it's kind of a bash script, and and that really ends up moving your modules away from being property driven, and forcing people to to know more about, you know, how the system is set up and how to, you know, you know, it, it really makes people deal with the how of things and not just the what. Uh, so, it's it's usually better to, to not allow that, uh, to not design. Um, it's good, you know, not design them. Um, like a bash module, it's it's good for power users, but in general, uh, it it can end up uh, causing a lot of pain. Uh, so the last thing about modules is they have a life cycle. Like I talked about a bit uh, about earlier, uh, this determines how they are behaving within the phase. Um, life cycle broadly, or not? Excuse me, not life cycle. The lifetime. Uh, the lifetime broadly shakes out into three pieces. There's an automatic, uh, which uh, we'll keep running. Uh, we'll keep executing the modules run command until all other uh, modules in that phase have finished. Uh, then you can uh, have a manual control over over the lifetime. Uh, for example, uh, chaos mesh. Uh, the chaos mesh module offers us uh, sort of two options. We can 
run a chaos experiment uh, for the entire, right? Run it to the end of the phase, run it for the whole phase. Um, and for our test, that's actually what we've done. Uh, it will, uh, you, know, you, you execute the, right, you execute the, uh, you deploy the, the chaos experiment. Um, like we saw, there was a cron job in that YAML. It's executing, uh, it's, it's killing a pod for 30 seconds every five minutes. And that's going to go on for the entirety of uh, the phase, which is really, the length of which is really determined by the NoSQL bench uh, workload. Alternatively, we could have just executed it once, uh, where we would have deployed the experiment. Um, uh, it would have run, and then we set a, a duration, right? So how long the experiment is going to be deployed onto the Kubernetes server or onto the Kubernetes cluster, uh, and then it will be removed. Uh, so we could see, we could schedule it in a way to only execute uh, that failure once. Um, so. Uh, this kind of relates back to what your modules are doing. Uh, if they're specific actions, uh, those come in the form of a, a sort of a discrete event, like executing uh, a command. Um, like in our in our scale up test, we were executing get pods, uh, cube control get pods. That's a discrete event. It you know you sort of you execute it, you get the output, and it's over. You know, and we do that repeatedly. Uh, and you contrast that with NoSQL Bench, which is sort of this uh, continuous uh, process. Uh, where you, you start the workload, it's running for a while, and then eventually it, it finishes. So when we're talking about the lifetime, we want to be sort of cognizant of how, uh, of what action our modules are taking and, and how we might want to uh, 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 execute them concurrently or sequentially with other modules. Right. Uh, ultimately, the goal is to have modules be very composable. Right. We want to have a sequence of things uh, with concurrency within them, uh, and so we can take uh, a series of actions, which you know translate to our events, uh, and really get the system into a very dynamic uh, state. Um, so then, the last. Uh, Oh, too far. The, the last the last component we have uh, is the artifact checker itself, right? And the, the real key here is elevating crucial information and determining the result. Um, going back to the beginning, I, I sort of likened Fallout to an experiment machine uh, where you have this hypothesis, you conduct your experiment, and then you have all of this data, and you have to review that data somehow. So... Uh, artifact checkers uh, are good at automating the review of all of the information collected by the fallout test. Uh, you know, you can look for specific things like were there uh, gossip failures? Or did did uh, Cassandra crash? Crash? Uh, was it you know? Did it run out of memory? Was it killed by the the memory killer? Um, uh, and as we've been using it extensively today, you can uh, elevate information. Uh, like this uh, performance report chart, just get a quick check of the performance. This this chart isn't anything we'll see today. Uh, it was a benchmark uh, uh, I was running in uh, GKE. Uh, um, artifact checkers have access to uh, every artifact produced by the ensemble, so they can correlate events between uh, different, you know, the client, the server. Um, really, that's a Quite a general, uh, yeah, quite quite a general component. Uh, you can really do a lot with them, but they are uh, crucially important. Put it that way. So uh, this brings us to the end of the uh, extension section, and we're just going to talk a little bit about operating a fallout server. Um, before we get too much into that, let's just go see how our chaos test went. Great, it passed. Um, we can come in and let's see if we can get a quick check of the performance impact. Come look at that quick performance report. Uh, it's it's sort of hard to see here, right? We don't have too much of a dip. So we know uh, because we are starting the chaos experiment at the same time uh, as we're starting a NoSQL bench workload, uh, at, at the beginning, we're sort of contending with the JVM warming up. Uh, and uh, that is, I think is kind of uh, obfuscating the first failure. But if we come out, uh, if you remember, we had a scheduled um, 
we had the failure scheduled for every five minutes. Um, so at 300 seconds, uh, which if uh, hopefully I didn't do my math embarrassingly wrong, we see this dip, right? And that would be the next uh, pod failure as, uh, you know, and then Cassandra reacting to, uh, you know, to, to the change in, in topology. So if we take uh, latency, we sort of see the same thing, right? This big spike uh, at 300. And it might actually have been that the chaos experiment happened here too. Again, so this is, is a pretty basic, uh, a, you know, charting tool, uh, just to kind of give you a quick sense of what has happened. Now, um, importantly, we can come into the Cassandra uh, system logs and check uh, the gossip. So if we search for is down, interesting. So node zero is probably the one being targeted lately. And we'll come here, search for is down. Oh, yikes, not even happening. Maybe this one was also execute. Moments of truth. Ah, interesting. So uh, again, timing is very important. Uh, by the looks uh, of this, uh, at the end of our uh, NoSQL bench workload, we had just killed uh, another Cassandra pod. Uh, sorry, Sean. Uh, maybe you can show logs from the last run of uh, pod failure scenario, which is not cloned. Maybe the uh, misconfiguration somehow. And I mean, the one you ran before, you launched it before. Great idea. Yeah, I yes. think it so may work. Yes, so we'll go through the same uh, sort of process. Quick check performance report, uh, similar sort of results where uh, it's contending with the JVM warm-up. Uh, this time, the, the chaos is a bit more dramatic. You can see it's a bit longer, uh, a bit more prolonged. Now, this time, if we if we come in uh, and check the Cassandra system logs, we'll see more information uh, about gossip. Uh, uh -huh. uh, you yes. can see, you know, nodes going going down. Uh, uh, this is the replaced one, and we will do is down. Uh, interesting. I guess this one was also replaced. Updating topology. Oh, so is now down. Oh, so that's why I was um, not running into stuff. It's uh, I was looking for the wrong thing. So that happens. Um, so neat. We've run we've run three tests: uh, a basic performance workload, uh, seeing the impact uh, scaling the cluster, and then seeing the impact of uh, uh, of a little bit of, a, of of chaos. So the last thing uh, worth talking about uh, in the UI is this comparison uh, performance report. Uh, we'll take our example. We'll take the latest. That looks very uh, interesting. Right. So th what this is going to allow us to do is compare uh, each of these three runs we've kicked off today. Uh, let's compare things. Um, and you can ignore that error at the top. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a standing thing that we've never really... Uh, it, it's an unimpactful error. Uh, again, we're not UI designers. We can hit run. So what this is doing, it's going to take the HDR files uh, from all of our runs and just the same as each of our runs we've had these performance reports, it's going to allow us to get a performance chart and look at all of them together. So uh, the blue is our simple baseline, uh, orange is our scale-up test, and uh, green is our pod failure. Uh, these are operations per second. Again, our pod failure uh, wasn't very dramatic. Uh, but let's go look at latency and see if we can uh, discern anything. So immediately we see uh, the scale-up test, right? We had this giant spike right in the beginning uh, when we were doing all of the bootstrapping and, and uh, gossip and, and uh, shuffling around data. Uh, Similarly, we can in the beginning we can see the green line, which is our chaos test. Uh, when we are contending, again, it, it's a bit hidden by the fact that we were uh, the JVM is warming up, uh, but we can see th the start of uh, the the benchmark is uh, much worse than uh, our baseline, right? The blue the blue line, our, our basic perf test, and this is because there was a pod failure right at the beginning. So hard, sort of hard to parse that out. Uh, in isolation, having a comparison like this does make it a lot easier. So again, not the most uh, detailed or in-depth charting tool, uh, but good at giving you a quick sense of how things shook out. That yes. does conclude 
all of the uh, Fallout UI work we had planned. So then, last thing to talk about, running a Fallout server in production. What we have running uh, on the AMIs today uh, is a, a local Fallout instance running a, a single user mode. Um, it's just sort of uh, something you can use quickly, get up and running, uh, do some development of Fallout, uh, run some simple tests. Normally, we have many users running many tests. Uh, and Fallout tests are typically long, typically a lot longer than the 15 minutes we've been running ours for. So when you want to be able to push out an update to the property-based components, right, the components which provision, configure, uh, and provide access uh, into uh, the system, you don't want to have to interrupt uh, running tests. Uh, for uh, the early years in, in Fallout, uh, we would have to schedule regular redeployments and, and sort of wag our finger at people uh, who wouldn't appropriately schedule their tests uh, 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 you know, around our redeployment needs. Um, you know, there was a sort of a slowness to get new components out because, you know, okay, well, we'll get it to you. We, you know, we merged it on Monday, but we'll get it to you on Thursday. It's, uh, it's a lag time that's, that's unfortunate. So what we've done is we've split uh, Fallout into two uh, many processes, um, right? The, the first process, which is always around, is the web service and queue, right? So the thing that users are interacting with is always available to them, right? Uh, I think this is the third time I'm going to make this joke, but we're not UI designers, so we really don't need to update the web service that much. Um, the UI has sort of been the same for a couple of years now. Uh, but importantly, we can create many runners, right? The runners are what are responsible for actually managing the execution of the test run. And these are what are really interacting heavily with the lifecycle and, and test harness APIs. Uh, so the test harness and lifecycle APIs are really where we're updating the components, we're adding new modules, we're adding new features, uh, introducing new systems. And that's really what people want access to. So uh, we can spin up uh, a, a queue runner uh, pair, right, where the queue is the, also the web service, uh, and the runner is handling the tests. And the queue tells the runner, uh, you're running these tests. And when we want to push out a new update, what we can do is launch a new runner to handle all of the new tests uh, and let the old runner uh, finish executing uh, any tests uh, it, it has been responsible for. Uh, but now all of the new tests we submit to Fallout can, can make use of the updated components. Uh, so that is a pretty quick summary of uh, uh, the, the design uh, and how we um, you know how we 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 keep Fallout live uh, as much as we can, uh, and and that for the most part brings me to the end of this presentation. This is one slide Great. left. Thank Honestly, you. I, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. I, I hope you did get something uh, out of this, uh, and I do hope you come and work with us uh, on the Fallout project uh, on our open source repo. Yep, so you know how to find us, github.com slash datastack slash fallout. And uh, there are plenty of things to do. So thank you for watching this uh, workshop. Thank you uh, for asking questions. Feel free to ask more questions. The instances for the training to run all the things uh, with a fallout installed, you should have got an email. If you didn't get by any means an email brought right to me. I'm Alex Voloshnev, developer advocate at Datastax. So my email is alexander.voloshnev uh, at datastax.com. And uh, we will find something for you. And uh, thank you so much for watching us, uh, Sean. Uh, thank you so much for doing this great workshop. And thank you all the team for the incredible tool. I really sorry I didn't have this uh, fallout so many years ago when I was taking care of these kind of issues. It would be really handy to have it. <laughs> yeah. yeah um... So I think we are done for today. And uh, thank you all for being with us. See you again at the next workshop. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Thanks people, for asking and answering.